Hi, welcome to A10 again. He and Kogan, we are still talking about a couple of things. At the same time, we're talking about uh, the cities and we're talking about the immigration population. And even though these documents that we'll kind of look at today um, deal with a lot of issues, we're gonna like peel away at them little by little. So we're still talking about the cities, that's where you get the urban over there, and we're talking about the poor. Yeah, peel away like an onion. Oh, so now, the urban port, you are going to see, when we, we start to see that, immigrants are coming off the boat and they are um, going through Ellis Island or Angel Island, where are they going to be settling? They're going to be settling in the cities. So when we are talking about the urban port, it should be no surprise that a lot of that urban poor are going to make up these immigrants who came out here. Came here, we didn't really have much to begin with. Yeah, so. like back to push pull. Like the push, they're being pushed out because of poverty in their old country. The pull is economic opportunity here in America. Right. So it doesn't mean they get off the boat and then all of a sudden they're doing well. They're, that's a process. Yeah. So there were a couple of uh, images taken by Jacob Rees, quite a few photos. Um, he also started off as an immigrant himself. He was living in poverty. So when we look at a couple of these images briefly, there's a lot that you can go into that addresses. A lot of problems. Um, the, the list of problems that you'll see in, in particular with this photo, um, it can go on and on, but we're really what we're going to be addressing today is what communities can do and what communities did do to kind of help address those problems. So anything that's striking in this one? The only thing that strikes me in this one is I don't want to be walking down this alleyway. Absolutely night. not. You know, the kids were always like, is that a bat in his hand? I'm like, no, it's, it's more of like a, a cane or a, a stanchion. But it's like, it just looks like this dude's like getting ready to jump somebody. It doesn't look like he's on his way to play a stick No, game. exactly. Um, and this also tells you a lot of things if you even want to just say, you know, technology, you know, washers and dryers are not available just yet. Yep. Uh, many Mondays you were able to see this because uh, typically that's when a lot of people were washing their clothes and then having them hang out. But, you know, there's, there's quite a few things that you can see in here. Uh, this does tell me that crime's possibly going to be a problem. Sanitation, public sanitation is also a problem. Yeah, Jacob Reese's photographs, he was amazing at capturing the life of urban poor. Yep. Um, he would either take candid photographs, yep. um, like, hey, boom, boom, yeah. capturing the moment, or he would actually pay some of these people a nickel to pose for a particular photograph. You know, to me, this looks like some ones that's definitely being posed. It's not like these guys are just like, hey, look down here. He probably paid them each a nickel, which was like, hey, uh, let me go get a Maybe meal. Maybe pick up a stick. Yeah, you know, to make it a little bit more dramatic. I was going to say, never mind. All right, so even looking at this one, uh, these are some common photos you see with him. That, and, and of course, this breaks your heart because you, you do have children on the street here. Um, looks like, you know, maybe they chose this particular spot, maybe low to the ground. Um, definitely winter. Um, you can see here, kind of like huddling up, I would say, here. Uh, Dirt on the ground over here. Absolutely. Interesting research. I found out this is actually one of the stage, stage photographs. Ones. You tell me before. Yeah, that. I didn't come you know, across. Jacob Reese paid these kids each, you know, a couple pennies or a nickel. This kid's even got like a smile on his face. And I, in class, I'm always like, "All right, you know, think back to when you were like three or four years old and you were supposed to be asleep, and mom or dad are coming up to check on you, and you're like, yeah, you're trying to really, you know, and you got like that little smile on your wow. face. Yeah, but to, again, to add the dramatic effect. The other thing too with him, I don't think you really see it in there. He was the first, one of the first to use a, a type of flash. Mm -hmm. You see it more in the tenements as well. More indoors, yeah. Yeah. Um, but again, you know, there's some problems here. Kids are on the street. Um, and even if this isn't as, as candid as we want, I mean, there are certain things you can see here. You know, the clothing is ripped up. Um, I know sometimes, I know growing up we had school clothes and play clothes. You know, that, that could be something here, but. Uh, I definitely had the hand-me-down clothes yes. for my older brother. <laughs> and of course, they were probably up to here because yeah. you grew pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, this one really breaks the heart as well um, because now they're even younger. So you have these kids up here, you know, maybe 9, 10, 12. Here, they're Five, much six, younger. Yeah. yeah. You know, you notice they're barefoot, they're in a gutter. You know, you, you see the, actually the downspout right here. So if it was raining, they'd be oh, getting gosh. soaked. Um, Maybe some sort of underground girder here. Uh, who knows if the subway was around back then? Probably yeah, an area where heat would probably be coming up. If yeah. I was, if I were them, they knew that possibly. They're definitely cold here. Yeah, in my research, I couldn't tell if this was staged or candid. Um, if you just happened to stumble across these kids sleeping, I don't know. You know, but as a historian, you know, we do know that Jacob Reese did take candid and staged photographs. So we do need to like look at this and be like, all right, it's awful. You know, and his whole intent here, as he pu will publish this book, How the Other Half Lives, was to 
bring awareness to the poverty issue in New York City specifically. So if you're one of those rich socialites living on the Upper East Side and you're seeing this slideshow, whether this is staged or candid, it's going to tear at your heartstrings. Absolutely. You're bleeding heart, if you would. If this is candid or staged, you know, the fact that the kids have their shoes off, mm -hmm. I mean, I couldn't see kids willingly taking them off. Uh, yeah, they probably were barefoot. Yeah, you know, probably, probably were. Yeah, but this is not, this is not like to think these are just like some actors that he pulled off the street. So, uh, you know, again, they're probably below, cold, trying to get out of the wind and the cold. Is, you're doing whatever you can to kind of stay comfortable. So when we're looking here, some of the problems he is bringing up is that you, you are seeing poverty in these certain areas throughout New York City and, and particularly how it's going to impact children. And that's a big thing even today with poverty, you know, because like there's arguments about poverty of like, well, just work hard, you know, get yourself out of poverty by hard work. Well, easier said than done. Sometimes you're, you're a victim of circumstance. Right. You know, maybe these kids' parents are poor, but they, they're poor by no fault of their own. You're not getting much of a leg up here. Right. And some, it, there's an expression where some people are born on second base. Mm -hmm. These kids are probably in the dugout. Yes. Yeah. You know, and if, if the parents can't afford shoes for these kids, they probably can't afford three square meals a day. Um, probably can't afford uh, to pay their heating bills. Probably can't afford many different things of uh, luxuries that we commonly afford as Americans today. So with all of those problems that you just brought up there, you know, you're talking about poverty, you're talking about uh, lack of food in certain homes, when we talk about what communities do, today or then, uh, today or, or in the 1800s, early 1900s, you do see communities that kind of come together mm -hmm. that try and do something to help out um, people who are suffering. Um, Babylon has a soup kitchen. Right. Um, there's Many a, communities do. Yeah, there's a there's a Food free there's a free uh, medical clinic over in, in a town right next to us. Sure. You know, so there's things that communities do to try to combat the effects of poverty because poverty in and of itself is awful, but the effects of poverty on a city, if you're poor, you are then now, I think it's like five times more likely to commit a violent crime. You know, because it's like, I see somebody walking down the street, they've got a nice watch, they've got a cell phone, they've got a wallet, I can now mug them. Now exactly. We're, yeah, we're talking I, about crime. I can now mug them. So when poverty is high, usually crime rates are high as well. So Indeed. cities cities have a um, uh, an incentive right. to try to combat poverty. And even with that, when you're bringing up the poverty and you're bringing up the, the whole more likely to commit a crime, well, if you look here, where was I going with that? <laughs> uh, when you look here, disease, that's it, healthcare. Yes, yes. Disease. Um, are these kids having proper healthcare? You know, if you're not getting the proper nutrients in your body, if you're not getting meals, you're going to be more susceptible or more prone to becoming ill. You know, go, and even for a second, if you go back to the, the two pictures of the kids sleeping, like we said, this kid's maybe 12. You know, it's not summertime. Right. So where should a 12-year-old be during the day? It's probably in school. Right. So, and that tells you something else. Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't have any regulations making sure that they are, in fact, yep. going to school. So this young lady, I shouldn't say young lady, when she was a young lady, <laughs> Jane Addams, uh, you know, when she, she grew up pretty much well off. Um, she, her father owned businesses, and she went sometimes onto the outskirts of the city, or she went into the certain city with certain areas with him. And, and saw some of the worst slums, I think it was Chicago? Yes. Worst some slums of Chicago, and made it, made it her life's mission to do something about it. Decided at a very young age, I think yeah. she was five or six, when she said, you know, I want to live amongst these people in a big house, but I want to be in a situation where I can help out. Yep. So she does wind up buying this big mansion in Chicago. A rundown. Rundown. It was like the, the guy had lost everything in the stock market. Not the big crash in 29. Right. Had lost everything in the stock market. A rundown mansion. She winds up purchasing it with her own money, renovates it, and turns it into Hull House. Right. Not Hill House, if you're a fan of the, the Netflix series, The Haunting of Hill House. This I is Hull no idea what you're House. talking about. Oh my God, great show. Oh, really? Yeah. So now, some of the services that she can provide there, um, you could provide a place for these kids to go after school. Um, Mr. Kogutov brings up, you know, hand-me-down clothing. You know, you could have uh, clothing drives. You know, you could have a kitchen operating right? twenty-four-seven to provide food. And, and some of these, and some of the ideas, and a lot of the things that that started here, you know, kind of, I guess you could say, splinter off and wind up becoming, you know, other things that people have emulated or copied. I mean, I know I just made huge donations to Big Brothers Foundation. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't think they were around during this time. No, period. you could provide childcare. Childcare, you know, is for thing. for immigrant families that you know, mom is like, well, I want to work, but I have to watch my three or four children. So send the, ch send the children off to Hull House, they'll provide free childcare for you. And since you're talking about a lot of these, a lot of the people who were poor in these areas were immigrants, some of the things that they may need, um, you know, how to apply for a job. 
Uh, classes in English. Classes in English. Classes in hygiene, since that was certain things that you were seeing that were, be, were a problem in these tenants. Mm -hmm. um, here you had, this is where the whole idea of kindergarten comes yep. from. Uh, social workers as well come out of this. And uh, there she is. She is like, I think, the, the considered the, the mother of social work. I believe so. That's why I probably said and, yeah. and the thing is, I think this actually just closed down like a couple of years ago. Oh, really? Yeah. It's sad. It is sad. Um, but, you know, while that thing does close down, there's still that legacy. So here you have Jane Addams now, you know, reading or talking to children. You know, again, where you did have adult volunteers who were trying to be a positive impact on, on these young people's lives. And, you know, that legacy of communities helping out and certain ideas, they all started here. Yep. You're talking about this settlement house movement. Um, because she started it, then other cities started it as well. So you saw, you saw a lot of people copy it or emulate it. We miss anything? No. Jane Adams. Jane Adams. Gotta love her. Thanks for watching.